In this video, I'm gonna to react to four extremely disturbing interviews with serial killers. and welcome to another episode of Kabir Considers. This is the place where I react to music, media, sports, anime, anything related to popular culture. I'll watch it with an open mind and give you my 100% honest reaction to it. And if you could please hit that like button early, I'd really, really appreciate it. Now, this is gonna be really interesting, albeit probably a bit creepy. Like there's something about, you know, a serial killer, someone who is, you know, able to take multiple lives it's just that kind of psyche that kind of mindset is just so alien to me yeah i find it so fascinating like you know these crime documentaries you know shows like dexter that kind of give us a glimpse into their into the inner workings of their brains what makes them do what they do mind hunt is another good one i mean it's just fascinating to me. And this video here, you know, four interviews with them, just to, I'm hoping the interviewers ask them really good questions to kind of just, just find out why they do what they do. So let's go. This is gonna be me reacting to four extremely disturbing interviews with serial killers. Let's do it. Whilst there are multiple disturbing interviews, some of the worst come from conversations with killers. So, from the woman who shot her own children, to the man who murdered a family. What? Her own kids? Join us. Responsible for the murders of five women, at only the age of 21, Bernard Giles was fortunately captured in 1974. More recently, Giles was interviewed by broadcaster Pierce Morgan, that day that you went out when you did kill for the first time, was that a morning when you woke up and you were with your wife and daughter and you just, something hit you and you went? No. Today may be the day? Every day may be the day. Every day? Every day may be the day. Do you know the name of your first victim? No, sir. Wow. Not now, I... Isn't that sad? So he took her life and he doesn't even know her name. It's like, you know, she's nothing to him almost. You know, just forgotten. Sick. Jerry, Nancy Jerry. Ah, Nancy Jerry. Do you know anything about her life? I found out later. She was a singer in a, uh, in a bar. That, that was it. Tell me what happened. We picked her up in Titusville. There's a wooded area and I pulled off the road. What does she look like? Um, a little shorter than me, um, fairly well built, pretty but not particularly pretty, brown hair, that's about it. Why did you do it? Why? And at what point did she realize that you were going to harm her? Well, not necessarily that I was going to harm her, because, you know, most of them don't assume you're, gonna, you're actually going to, to kill them. Most of them assume it's a rape or something like that. And what did you then do? I told her to get out of the car, and that's when she became afraid. You know, uh, up to that point, I assumed that she thought it was just going to be a rape. You know, I walked her over next to her in front of a tree, and then I shot her. Just like that? Yes, sir. Wow. And what were you feeling as you did that? I mean, the thing is, is, you know, what is your passion in your life? Hold on. So he's trying to, to compare it to like a hobby almost, like a, a passion, an interest that someone may have. What the hell? Uh, I mean, go and hunt, you know, hunt if you want to, you know, do something regarding animals or something like that you know you can't kill people as a hobby it's just uh... you know what is the thing that you like to do more than anything else wow and you're doing it 
it, you are so there that it, you can almost, it's like you can see the atoms vibrating. I mean, it's just, it's difficult to describe. Jeez, man. <laughs> I'm getting the heebie-jeebies. Soon after the killings, his wife and daughter left the trailer park and moved out of the state. He would never see them again. You lost a wife, you lost your daughter. I lost everything. You lost everything, yeah. And do you know what happened to your daughter? Was Have you it? ever heard from her? No, no, sir. How does that wow. make you feel? What can you do with that? We had a we had a picture that there. You? What do you feel when you see your daughter? I don't know exactly. Wow. When you look at your own daughter that age, smiling, innocent, happy, what do you feel about the the young woman you killed? I I don't put those together. Uh, this guy, it's almost like he's got no emotion. You know, he, he had a little smile on his face when he saw his daughter, probably the first time in, in decades. Just a little smile, that was it. Like, he just seemed completely... I guess that's one of the, 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 the qualities of a psychopath, isn't it? You know, they, they kind of have no emotion. They're good at mimicking it, but they don't really have emotion. I mean, what would you feel about a man who snatched your daughter and terrorised and raped and killed her? I certainly wouldn't appreciate it. That, that's it? That's how you'd feel? <laughs> like I said, I certainly wouldn't appreciate it. Wow. Wow. Believed to have killed around 70 people. 49 year old Tommy Lee. 70 people. In cells, was executed in 2014. Years earlier, on November 18th, 1987, he brutally murdered the Dardine family. Cells had first overpowered the father, 29 year old Russell, then severed his penis and shot him dead. Oh my God. After this, he'd raped Russell's wife, 30 year old Elaine before using a baseball bat to beat her and their two-year-old son, Peter, to death. Finally, as the severity of the beating caused the land to go into labour, Cells killed their newborn baby girl. Oh my god. <clears throat> so altogether, about how many you killed, the question is, and you think um, your answer is, one. <laughs> See, you trying to sew me up in 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 in, in a, a wow. Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, do the math. Uh, a couple, three year, four year, for twenty years. What, what does that add up to? Fifty to six. How was he never caught for so long? Seventy. I I I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. Okay. Probably more. Uh -huh. Some of the people you kill, they could be men, they could be women, they could be kids. It was like an equal opportunity. I didn't form a, a pattern as most. Yeah, it was like anybody was fair game. It did not matter, blood is blood. Uh -huh. It didn't matter man, woman, child. Yeah, no more thrill to kill the mayor of the town than the, the homeless guy on the street. No. Quite a few times, not all the times, but quite a few times, it was a mother and a kid. And I have an answer for that. Okay. And, and I thought hard about that because it's been... Just look at the almost, you know, the almost jovialness in which he's answering these questions. Again, no emotion. Zero remorse. Like smacked up inside my head a time or two. Uh, I know what I went through as a child. The nightmares, the, the, the drama, the reality of, of who I was and, and what was done to me. I never wanted that to the, happen to another person. I had something against that person. Uh -huh. and, 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 and there was another person there that witnessed it. I didn't want them to uh, 
carry that on their shoulder the rest of their life. Uh. So rather than let that person potentially go through what you went through, you would rather kill them. Is that what he's saying? That doesn't make any sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, you're putting out of the misery they would have had if they had to live through that all that. That's the best I can answer it. Uh -huh. If it was just a question of putting the other person, besides the one that you were targeting, uh, out of the misery of having to live life with missing mama or missing, you know, whoever, um, maybe you would have gone about it in a gentle way. Is there a gentle way? Yeah. Oh, how you know when they'd strap you to a gurney that, that everything inside of you just ain't burning up? In one case, Sells murdered an entire family, bludgeoning a pregnant woman, her three-year-old, and her unborn baby to death. It's, it's the sensation of, of, of the blood. It's, Is this him? Is that him? The sensation, tying that scarf around your neck and, and just watching your eyes, just, it's, it, it's, it's the sensation seeing, seeing that skin pull apart. It, it, it's, 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 it's sensation sticking that knife in and, and just pulling and, and knowing it's sharp enough to just go all the way up. Was there anything different the first time when you killed a person? Was there a different rush, a different feeling? That first one, I can still see it in slow motion. Uh -huh. and, and each one after that became more... Speed it up more routine I, I can't find the dragon i'm chasing no more yeah. so it's literally like an addiction it's like an addiction for him i can't find that rush that that same that same release of anger uh -huh. i felt that first time so there was a release of anger oh without a doubt it is like busted a piece of glass and, and there's just little shivers all up in there cells seem to feed off his own anger of which there was no shortage, he became addicted to the release of this anger, which occurred through violent means. Paradoxically for Sells, evil for him was other people. Today, I might say, you know, Tommy, Dr. Stone, he's okay. And tomorrow I might wake up and say, you know that bastard, he, he, he tried to slide a slip one in on me. You understand? I do. That's why there's this glass. <laughs> Thing. Man, this this is this is crazy, honestly. Admittedly. Man, look at the eyes, just soulless, empty eyes. The Ann Downs isn't a serial killer, but that isn't through a lack of trying. In 1983, Today, after a string of I'm short relationships. Diane finally found love in her co-worker, okay. Robert Knickerbocker. Robert, so however, rejected bad. her, he, he, stating he, he had no interest in being a father to her three children, Christiane, Cheryl understand? Lynn, and Danny. Subsequently, on May 19th, 1983, Diane pulled over onto the side of a quiet road and shot each of them multiple times. She then shot herself in the arm and drove to the nearest hospital. Tragically, Cheryl was already dead while Stanny was paralysed and Christy barely alive. Meanwhile, Diane told doctors that they'd been attacked by a bushy-haired man who had attempted to hijack the car. Police, though, were sceptical, and after a lengthy investigation, arrested her on February 28th. That face, that face, man. It's, it's literally terrifying. There's something in her eyes, like demonic. Do you know what I mean? There's something demonic in her face, man. 1984. We were just out, I guess, sightseeing, I guess you'd say. And the kids got tired. They fell asleep in the car. So I decided to just head on home. But I saw a road I hadn't been on before. We liked to take back roads. And just went down that road. And there was a guy standing in the road, flagging me down. So I stopped. If I had shot my own children, would I not have done a good job of it? Why would I have taken my kids to the hospital? Wouldn't I have made sure they were dead and then cried crocodile tears? That's insane to think that I would do such a thing and then bring the, the witnesses in against myself. That's crazy. Christy woke up, and as I say, she may be the only one to get me out of this. Would I have brought her to the hospital? Wouldn't she be the one that I would make sure is dead? There are too many holes in it. Too many holes in it. She doesn't realize that the language she's using is not what 
a, a mother in that situation would use at all. You know, the emotion is completely wrong. It's, it's almost like she doesn't realize what emotions she should be trying to convey to the audience. Yeah, she's a psycho. When this man shot my daughter, my first reaction was to snap back to my childhood, to the pain that had happened to me back then, my marriage, my entrapment by society. This man was bigger than me. He was stronger than me. He had more power because he had a gun. And I stood there and I looked at Christy reaching and the blood that just kept gushing out of her mouth. And, and I, what do you do? Everybody says you sure oh, were lucky. God. Well, I don't feel very lucky. I couldn't tie my damn shoes for about two months. The way she's laughing, she's laughing. Your kids are, are dead. It is very painful. It is still painful. The scar is going to be there forever. I'm going to remember that night for the rest of my life, whether I want to or not. I don't think I was very lucky. I think my kids were lucky. If I had been shot the way they were, we all would have died. What? You can't replace children, but you can replace the effect that they give you. What? And they give me love. They give me satisfaction. They give me stability. They give me a reason to live and a reason. <laughs> I wonder what she's thinking. <laughs> I would be thinking, get me the hell out of here. <laughs> to be happy, and, and that's gone. They took it from me. But children are so easy to conceive. At night, when I close my eyes, I can see Christy reaching her hand out to me while I'm driving, and the blood just keep coming out of her mouth. And that, maybe it'll fade too with time, but I, I don't think so. That okay. haunts me the most. Oh my God, this, she's evil, man. Pure evil, just look at that face. Arguably the most infamous serial killer of all time. You've likely seen most of Ted Bundy's interviews. However, there is one very rare and disturbing recording that few have heard. In it, Bundy describes the murder of 18 year old student, George Ann Hawkins. I was moving up the alley using a, uh, a briefcase and some crutches and a young woman walked down and about halfway down the block I encountered her and asked her to help me carry the briefcase, which she did and we walked back up the alley. Basically when I reached the car, what happened was I knocked her, knocked her unconscious with the crowbar. And uh, they handcuffed her and put her in the driver's, I mean the passenger side of the car and drove away. One of the things that makes it a little bit, well, among the things that makes it difficult is that uh, at this point she was quite lucid talking about things. It's, it's funny, it's, it's fun, not funny, but it's odd the kinds of th things people say in, under those circumstances. She had a Spanish test the next day, and she thought that I had taken her to help tutor me for a Spanish test. Man, this poor, poor girl. The long and short of it was that that I again knocked her unconscious. Wow. And strangled her. Oh. Can you hear that? The Hawkins girl's head was severed and taken up the road about 25 to 50 yards. This is and buried in a location about 10 yards west of the road on a rocky hill. Why is he whispering? Side. By this time it was almost dawn, but on this particular morning I, I was just absolutely, again, just shocked, kind of scared to death, shocked, horrified. About, and I went down the road throwing the briefcase, the, the, the crutches, the rope, the clothes, just tossing them out the window. And the crowbar. Every the, the way he's laughing. Handcuffs. Everything. I gotta get mad at myself a few weeks later because I'd have to go out and buy another pair. I mean, it's not comical, but that's what would happen. This was just... I was in a, a sheer state of panic, of just absolute horror, you know. Uh, it's like, at that point in time, this consciousness of what has really happened is like you break out of a fever or something. I would, that is. And uh, so I would... I drove... <laughs> Talk about details coming back. I couldn't find one of the shoes, so I thought it was there, but it wasn't. So I went back. This was this was the next day. 
got on my bicycle, rode back to that little parking lot. I knew there were police all over the place by that time. So I went back to that parking lot and I found both pierced ear the, the pierced earrings and the shoe laying in the parking lot. So I surreptitiously gathered them up and rode off. So there you are. Wow, man, that was extremely, extremely creepy. Just one thing, the common denominator that I noticed was all of them described things with the same kind of absence of emotion, an absence of remorse. There was almost like a, uh, a jovialness about how they were speaking or the stories that they concocted. You know, there was never any tears, never any sort of anguish. Nothing like that, man. Just real signs of psychopaths because, yeah, that's, I believe, what you know, the, one of the biggest traits, uh, you know, the, the lack of emotion, but the mimicking of emotion. Very disturbing indeed. Thanks for watching, guys. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, turn on bell notifications, and keep throwing the recommendations my way. I know I say it all the time, but they genuinely help me out because if I know you enjoyed watching something, I'll definitely enjoy reacting to it. So like, subscribe, turn on bell notifications, keep throwing the recommendations, and I'll catch you in the next one.